Welcome to Barrels and Burbs with hosts John Engel and Roberto Cabrera. Over the next hour, you're going to learn some insider knowledge that will help you overcome and strategize in the cutthroat world of real estate. Now, here are your hosts, John and Roberto. Welcome, everybody. Burrows and Burbs, number 122, season four. I'm your host, John Engel from Douglas Elliman in Connecticut. And that's my co-host, Roberto. I am on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. I work for Brown Hair Stevens. Thanks Roberto for being here. Cabrera. And we've got every Thursday, three o'clock East Coast, we come to you with insightful conversations about the national real estate landscape, any place that might be of interest to New Yorkers, hence the boroughs and burbs. And today we are in Northern Virginia, Maryland, and the DC suburbs. And we wanna understand why that's important to New Yorkers. I was surprised to find out that three of the most wealthy counties in America are in the D.C. suburbs and Northern Virginia. So we want to understand what is the allure, what's the attraction of this area of the country. Before we begin, I want to share my screen and give a shout out to my friends at Grace Farms. They're having their third annual Design for Freedom Summit coming up on March 26th. 10 to 6 p.m. See all those people coming. They all gather in the 800 seat auditorium and discuss the uh, the problems we're having with forced labor in the building material supply chain. It's going to be an impressive uh, day of panels, roundtables, tours with a jazz breakfast and a cocktail reception. You'll find it at designforfreedom.org and make sure you sign up and get your tickets. And without any further ado, I'd like to introduce the Shively team from Douglas Elliman, Tracy Shively, Laura Bean, Melody Hooker, and Emily Shively. And I'd like to introduce my other guest, Shari Granval, who's from Compass. And without further ado, let's just dive right in. And can you explain to me, Shari, what is your market? Where is your market? Where in the world are we? And um, what's your expertise? Hi, thank you for having me. So a little bit about my history too. I actually live in DC proper, but in a neighborhood that feels a bit like a suburb. I came to Washington DC to go to college here. I went to GW and I ended up getting stuck here in a good way because I met my husband my senior year and he, this is apropos, he got hired by a big Wall Street law firm in New York City and he was um, was choosing where to work and he chose the DC office and his reasons for choosing DC and he could have worked at the New York office or a couple other offices around the country, his reason for choosing DC and I saw this with a lot of his uh, classmates at Yale Law School, and they had good options, those Yale Law grads. <laughs> he chose DC because of the lower cost of living here in comparison to New York and, and just having a bit more space and greenery. So that's why he and several of his classmates chose this area. But my expertise, this is my 20th year in real estate. Uh, I love this career. It's a blessing. My expertise is really inside the city and the close in Maryland suburbs. Most of my clientele, they're either they've either lived here for a while or they are moving from other places. So I do have a, a perspective on why people do choose like Maryland over Virginia sometimes or Virginia over Maryland or to stay in the city um, proper. We'll get it. We'll get into that more later. <laughs> Excellent. And uh, Laura, why don't you talk to us about uh, the Shively team and uh, a little bit about what market you cover? Absolutely. Okay. Um, thank you. I um, I have been part of the Shively team for about four years now, but um, I am originally born and bred in Virginia, Maryland, and D.C. I was born in D.C., uh, grew up in the my first five years of DC and then the rest of my life in Virginia. So I think that when it comes to knowing the landscape of the DMV, which is what we're commonly referred to, the DMV, um, th that we 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 know it pretty well. Uh, Tracy Shively, who's the head of our team, um, I I'm sure she's next to 
talk, but she she and I both are true Washingtonians, born, raised, and know quite a bit. And I think our niche is um, the luxury market in Northern Virginia, Maryland, and D.C., but we tend to focus a lot in the um, the Northern Virginia area because it does seem to draw a lot of um a lot of people now a lot of people are moving in to northern virginia should i move should i uh should i ask tracy or should i put up the map what what do you what what the map i'm going to put the <laughs> map up because we keep talking about uh D dmv and nova nova i guess is the northern virginia market and you just mentioned a new acronym for me, which is the, the what, the DMV? Yeah, a lot of people know us as the DMV, which is District, Maryland, Virginia. Okay. And, um, you know, it's the proximity of the district. So you either live in Virginia, you live in Maryland, or you live in D.C. It's it, We all kind of um, share district the district as our common common denominator. Because it looks like to get to Maryland, I have to go, I have to drive pretty far out of Washington, D.C. But yeah. to get to Northern Virginia, it's rather short. It's right over the river. <laughs> Can I interject? I live in D.C. and I can see Maryland from my house. It's a block. <laughs> Okay. Okay. You can see Russia from our house. <laughs> it's the same idea. Yeah. Okay. And we live right by the Potomac and we literally in, in an area called Great Falls and you literally can look over the Potomac into Maryland. Okay. Where Great is Falls that on this is map? so beautiful. That is such a beautiful area. It's it is pretty. Left. Thank you. You're kind Great of going north, bit... northwest a little bit. Yeah. Above okay. Great Falls is a bit west of McLean. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Keep going. Top left, right under the restaurants. Yep. Okay. Right to the left, right by the Capitol. Picture. Oh, over the photo here. Of the Capitol. The photo of the Capitol. Oh. Right now you're left. my neighborhood. You're almost <laughs> my neighborhood right now. <laughs> On the left perimeter at the top, Great Falls. Across see the where it says Great Falls Park. Oh, I see way over there. Oh my gosh. Yeah, but you know what? It's eleven where I live is eleven miles from downtown DC. So that's kind of the misnomer, is that you think it's so far, but it's not from DC. Com you're Compare physically how many miles and how how long of a commute when you're in Great Falls? So it takes me about 20 minutes to get to the city. Okay. Into DC. And I'm 11 miles from the city. Wow. I'm 40 miles from New York City and it, it, and there's no way I'm getting in in less than an hour. But you're here all the wow. time. <laughs> <laughs> you are. So okay. let me, can I ask something about the dynamic of living around D.C.? Like in New York, the concentration of your, your occupation, I mean, work from home has changed things, but people, everybody came to the city to work for the most part. And in the suburbs, you do, and you went back home to the suburbs. D.C. is a little bit different where there's not, I mean, this is work downtown, but not everybody works downtown. People who live in Northern Virginia, they you know, their offices are in Northern Virginia and vice versa and things like that. So the commute to downtown is less important, right? Or not? Depends. I think the higher, the really wealthy um, people that live here don't necessarily have to go down to their offices all the time, but it still is a factor for a lot of people who are moving here, especially first time home buyers and people in kind of middle budgets, not the super high end. It is important, their commute. So often you do hear, I hear um, new buyers when I speak with them that they want to be about, they ask me for their for guidance on about 30 minutes to work. And um, like Laura was just saying, it's not the miles because you really could be, five miles to me is really far. I live in DC and five, for example, Cap, I live all the way in the upper Northwest portion where you can walk to Bethesda to Chevy Chase and right over the bridge to McLean, Virginia is very close, very close. Like these areas are less than 10 minutes. They're practically walkable. But for me to get to Capitol Hill all the way on the other side of the city, it's not even five miles. It takes 30 minutes with no traffic. It could, if I am going there during rush hour, I give myself almost an hour because of traffic. So it, that's that's the interesting thing about this area. So in Maryland, you got to fight through a little bit more of the city to get there, as opposed to Virginia. You're kind of when the moment you hit D.C., 
you're kind of downtown. You have to cross a bridge in Virginia. So in my opinion, it's a little, you're dealing with crossing it, water. And so it's it, not one bridge. There's several. There's bad traffic on them. But anyway. <laughs> Tracy, are, you're on the other side of the bridge. I am in McLean, Virginia. And okay. so it, it it is depending on the time of day and, and, you know, where you're trying to get in the city. Uh, obviously, you have to kind of plan around that. But I think that people coming into our area are looking for where their commute is going to be. And I think COVID changed a lot of the commuting in how many days a week they had to go into the office or work from home or whether they needed to be near um, the metro in order to commute versus drive and what industry are they in? So we have certainly headquarters uh, for, I would say over a hundred of regional and national headquarters that are in our area. So a lot of times that is a driving factor to what location, whether it's Virginia, Maryland, or DC. Has that been really the shift? Cause that was my, when, when I, I used to be in the internet business before I was in real estate and everybody in the internet business uh, back in the nineties uh, figured out that um, Northern Virginia was the center of the internet. It was the backbone, it's where the backbone was. Since that time, I think 300 data centers have sprung up in Northern Virginia. And it is, I think, my perception is that uh, it's the number one industry is technology and internet related services. And so it seems to me that Tracy, being on your side of the river, the McLean, you say, you know, DC uh, is is important, but it's not the most important. It's not driving our economy. It's not driving our real estate. Is that an accurate assessment? It used to be maybe in the 80s, but once the internet got invented by Al Gore, um, Northern Virginia, it, it became the number one industry in Northern Virginia. Is that accurate? Yes, I, I would say that that's accurate. I think that Virginia is a little bit more business friendly. So that's why I think you're having a lot of the data centers that are out in Loudoun County. Uh, they have, you know, and that's that's servicing data from all over the world, but they're not necessarily the offices where people go in and work from. So I think even remotely working or working in a lot of other cities like Reston or Chantilly or Arlington. There are many other um, areas in Virginia that people may be going into, even if the data is being stored out in Loudoun County. Now, I'm going to put the screen up again. You keep talking about out in Loudoun County. I see yes. Washington. I know you're in McLean. Where is this Loudoun County? So you want I to see go Reston west? out there. Yes. Yeah, so, you're going out of it. So, you need to go further to the left or on the screen west. Okay. So where Dulles Airport is yes. and that, that corridor going all the way to the Potomac River. So going north. Right. You're encompassing Leesburg. Okay. So you'll see Ashburn. So Ashburn is a is a high concentration of those data centers. Okay. And then if you go further west, that's Leesburg. You go further south, um, you'll you'll basically get down to Chantilly. Chantilly is like the border of Fairfax County into Loudoun County. And so is it fair to say that Reston was the first maybe batch of data centers and then the data center and tech industry moved uh, up west. here to Ashburn and down here to Chantilly? Yes, yeah. it, was, it was certainly the land that was available to be developed. So there was a uh, vast acreage uh, west and around uh, Dulles Airport. So it was Tyson's and Reston, and now we've moved west of Dulles. So it's really, Dulles is uh, the center. People want to be close to the airport so they can get somewhere else, I guess. But um, So it's really not centered around Washington, D.C. anymore. Well, they extended <laughs> the metro all the way out to Dulles Airport last November. Mm. So that also gives 
uh, people that want to live out in that Brambleton, uh, Stone Ridge, um, Broadlands, and they opened up a metro station at uh, Moorefield Station. So Has it be, can I ask you something? Oh, I, I lived there in the 90s, early 90s. It was a long, long time ago. And all that area was very, it was kind of sparse. And there were neighborhoods and they were all kind of these new manufactured neighborhoods and things like that. And it seems to me that it, now it's so much more dense. Has a lot, have a lot of those neighborhoods matured? Is it, is it, you know, does it feel like it might feel like in Alexandria that's, that has a tremendous long history, you know, about it? Does it feel like that? Or does it still feel like this new kind of, you know, these new neighborhoods with like little strip malls everywhere and things like that? Well, you don't have the historic value that Old Town Alexandria or Alexandria with older homes that were built many years ago. When, when Loudoun County really took off maybe about 20 years ago, they are big planned communities. So they have shopping centers, they have schools, they have um, businesses all around these planned neighborhoods built in with recreation. And so a lot of these planned developments have kind of started to merge together. They were vast lands and certainly they're they're reserving green space in a lot of a lot of them, but you're also merging major neighborhoods that are three and four thousand homes in one neighborhood and they're starting to blend together. Melody, I, it looks awful cold to be Virginia. It's <laughs> not the Virginia I'm imagining. <laughs> we had a ton of snow until this morning. It's heated up to like 50 something degrees and it all melted. So, yes. It doesn't look like it's all melted. It looks cold. <laughs> it looks colder than Virginia should look. Well, you know, we are Northern Virginia, oh. not Southern Virginia. Yes. I was just going to add one thing that Tracy said um, about the planned community. I know, Roberto, you were asking about that. Reston, fun fact here, Reston was one of the first ever planned communities in the United States, whereas they built the town center around it. And it became a prototype to what kind of took off all over the country that these, that, you know, build condos, build multifamily, single family uh, around a town center. And that was in the seventies. And Roberta, you probably, you may have, you know, I don't know, that was the, that was, it used to be so far West. And really and then, good friends who live uh, there. We used to go there all the time. Right. It was kind of going there. You know, we were like, oh, we're going to their house. Okay, so we got to go. But it was fine. But it was it was very sparse. Yeah. It yeah. wasn't as, you know, I'm assuming now, because everybody says it's changed so much and everything has grown out, 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 further and further. And I'm just assuming that there's a density that's just started to spread that way, which also makes me think that anybody who's commuting to the city is not probably moving there because it must be really onerous to go all the way into the city with the traffic. I remember Route no. 7 was horrible. Right. No, it's actually, as Tracy said, the Metro, which is our subway system, has been, has keeps sprawling out West. So the subway system is so convenient. And then we have the Beltway and we have, we have major arteries that keep getting wider and wider. I think we're up to six lanes or eight lanes now. So it's really sp sprawling towards there. And then the data centers, um, one other fact about that, and John, when I first met you, you were funny. You said the data centers live there. Why shouldn't I? 70% um, of the world's data goes through the Ashburn area. So it is truly, but nobody really lives near a data center. <laughs> it's not the desired location, a big building, but yeah. So how do you, we, how do we know what the desired, uh, that's the key word here. What is the desired location? And to qualify me, when I show up, do you say, oh, are you DC centric or are you Northern Virginia, you know, data center centric? Um, or are you school system? Are you looking for a great school system? Are you looking for, you know, so what is it that you're going to ask me first in order to start to guide me in the right direction? Budget. It's really, you get the reason why people move in my experience so far out, because you're, we're getting into like really long commutes into the city is because of affordability. You just, as you get further away from DC, you get more for your money, the further out you go. So McLean is very affluent. It's expensive. It's right next to DC. It's, it's close, you know, and these, it's an established neighborhood. So people really are, and same with the Maryland side going, 
the going further out is the generally the reason is because of affordability. It's just price per foot is so much higher when you're in the city and when you're super close and you get more for your money, the further out you go. Now there are other reasons like you cannot get, um, you cannot live on three acres in it's very rare, like in DC or in like very, very close in Maryland. Like you have to go to Potomac and it's very beautiful and there are these sprawling estates. So for sure, there are people there that are super wealthy that are choosing those neighborhoods like McLean on the Virginia side because they're beautiful communities with like am amazing estates where you can have a tennis court in your backyard and a pool and a pool house that it's really hard to find. And unbelievably exorbitantly expensive if you could find it like super super close in or Kenwood and there are parts of Chevy Chase where you can get that for a lot a lot of money but that is generally my experience the reason people call me they tell me their budget and that's where they're that's like the neighborhoods are really based their search what's a lot what's a lot of money yeah for three acres um, in Potomac yeah, and it's not like those I mean their homes I mean the would they ever come on the market but you're you you see estates I mean I've that are like, you know, eight, five plus million dollars that are, it just depends on how much land. But you don't, are. do you see $15 million estates? Rarely, but it exists, it, rarely. And mm -hmm. honestly, a lot of time, a lot of times these people, they they build these in, incredible prop homes. They're once in a lifetime places. They really hardly ever go on the market, but it's rare you're in that price point. I mean, the highest sale in, in, DC and Maryland. I don't know what the highest one was in Virginia. Now I'm forgetting. I just saw the stats, but it doesn't come anywhere near that. The highest sale in DC last year was 17 million. And that's because it was a six acre parcel and it was appealing to developers. So where? Laura, just curious, across, <laughs> literally across the river is where you are. What's the, what's the difference between Great Falls, Potomac? Not a lot. Great Falls, there is acreage requirements. So you have anywhere from the least would be one acre up to five, 10, 15 acres. That's rare. Most of them are five and 10, uh, but the minimum is one acre. Uh, most everybody's on septic and well in Great Falls. So that's, some people don't like that, but so, you, so you're you have talking land. about Great Falls here and Potomac Falls is roughly here. No, yes. Potomac no. across, uh, literally to the right of Great Falls, across the river. Straight, oh, right? right there, this right there. Potomac. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes, literally. So is this two. Great Falls, Potomac, a place of big estates? If I have $10 million and I want something really special, you might take me to these two places? Yes, yes. Okay. and McLean. Or if and you want girls. to be like Georgetown in Washington, D.C. or very close in. Oh, no. I want green okay. space. I want green space. I don't want to be um, chock-a-block in, down in Georgetown. I, you know, I, I want some elbow room. <laughs> so well, I have County to go to Potomac, is... Great Falls, and McLean for that mm -hmm. elbow room, that three acres? Yes. Okay. And is it m worth more if I am on the river? Yes, absolutely. Exponentially more? Yes. 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 Would you ever suggest I go to Middleburg or is that too far out? Well, it depends on what you want. If you're an equestrian and you love the horses and you love, you know, 30, 50, 100 acres, Middleburg is the place to be. And for Oh my God, it's um, way out here. It looks like it's like. Yeah, but it's beautiful. It's green. beautiful. <laughs> it's all just green, nothing around the Middleburg. That but for fourth homes, many of them, many people in Washington own their own vacation properties there in Middleburg. Yeah, it's horse country. It's beautiful. It's Same. about an hour and it's it's a great getaway. Maybe also a lot of wineries. Um, all right. So then let's say uh, you were talking the other day. And I, so I pulled up the map uh, of what's available and it looks like 2000. 600 are these are these indication of how many listings are available the density of listings is that a fair statement yes yes okay and you were saying that yesterday this one at 18 680 river look port in leesburg uh, went under contract so tell me about what 3 million gets me cuz 3 million is really sort of a sweet spot in new canaan connecticut right now um, right. and I think that 3 million would get you, might get you this kind of a house in New Canaan. So 
I identify with this kind of house. How much acreage? Just, before you talk about it, just tell us, tell us what, like how far it is from DC and then you can keep going. I see the green space I want. So. Yeah. So yeah. Leesburg, this listing um, is kind of an anomaly because it's on 8.3 acres oh, wow. in Leesburg and it um, has water access. It it's bumps up to a creek, a real pretty creek, but it's 3 million. It's about 10,000 square feet. That includes a guest quarter above the garage. Um, it's three full levels. Um, what else am I missing, guys? <laughs> seven car, seven car garage. That's right. Um, Thanks. So much. Yeah, and that seven, kitchen. That's good is, for you, John. <laughs> the kitchen is to die for. It's beautiful. So yeah. I will say, you get this out in Leesburg for three million. But if you put this house with its acreage in Great Falls, Potomac, or McLean, it probably doubles yeah. because mm -hmm. of how much closer you are into the city. Like everyone's been saying yeah desirability of the like mclean and great falls just you know much more expensive mm -hmm. but if is you want to find something in great falls and potomac i mean is there inventory we're in such an inventory shortage i mean low inventory you have to be really patient it exists same with potomac it, it, potomac it exists it's just that we have our we have so we're we're Month after month, our prices are still going up a little bit each month. Every single month, our volume is down. Our inventory is down. Can we just quickly talk about uh, one thing, which is regardless of all the different industries that are there, D.C. is obviously a very political town. And every four years or every eight years, there is a whole different administration that comes in. And there's a lot of people that have come to the city for that and then they're gone. Is there a tremendous amount of transiency with like on a cycle like that? And because of that, or is a lot of your housing product rental property? No, now DC used to be such a political centric town, but with the amount of business that has come to the region, it's there's someone else ready to scoop up any house that, you know, a senator on or a anything. sale on a sale side. Like they just side. go through that cycle and they're out four yeah. years and they're gone. Yeah. I mean, rental rates are actually, they have increased a lot, especially last year because of the desirability of the area and our lack of inventory right now. So, and everybody has to be here and have a place to live. So some people had to move into rentals and are just waiting for that house to pop up, but the low inventory holds them back. Is the is the majority of your housing stock sale property or is it rental? Sale for single family um, and townhomes usually, rental for condos. I mean, there's apartment buildings, but mostly single owner properties. Yeah. Because here in New York, 70% of our housing stock is rental property, which is astonishing. Yeah. No, no not, not the case here. And there we have really tight inventory. I've actually had a few people get in touch with me. Most of us don't even do rentals here. Like agents who do sales don't don't do rentals, but occasionally do. And so I, I've had a few people reach out this past week and they were really in high price points for rentals. Like they're will, what they're willing to spend a month on a rental here because they're not sure if they're going to stay or if it's a short term position. But um, for this area, it's really high. I mean, like a $10,000 budget, you know, $10,000 a month. That's a, that's a big budget. And there's very little to look at for single wow. families. Is, it, is part of that because they can't find what they want to buy also at all? In my experience, oftentimes people come here and they're not, they are scared to commit to a neighborhood because the neighborhood's so important to them. And they want to figure out like where they like and if they have kids, like what schools they like. So they want to come and kind of test drive at first the area. So oftentimes that's what I'm hearing why people want to come here and rent first because of like this conversation, the differences in the neighborhoods, the schools, like what your lifestyle is going to be like. Do you want to have, do you want to be able to go downtown for dinner? Like, you know, even if you are a couple miles outside the city, you know, like for example, loud and I don't, that's really far to get into DC to go out to dinner. And I find that, you know, people sometimes it's a lifestyle decision. Let's talk about schools. Where, I mean, 
public schools are, are there certain areas of Northern Virginia and Maryland where the public schools are considered very good? And then how many people are really opting for the private schools, the Episcopals, the Madeiras and all that type of thing? So I will say Fairfax County, well, Virginia in general is actually fourth in the country in terms of their public school education, specifically Fairfax County is the best in the state. So that Northern Virginia hub still but of course, uh, McLean and Great Falls, the reason why so many people also go there, well, well, one, the land, but then two, you go to Langley High School, which is the number one school in the state. So there are a lot of other schools that are good in Nova, but generally that's why the biggest and the most affluent people go into McLean and Great Falls specifically. How big is that school? I mean, I'm just trying, I want to, I want to picture it. The, so, the high school in New Canaan is 1,200 kids. So I went there myself. I graduated a pro about five, six years ago. I probably had 2,500, 3,000 kids in my class. It's mainly because we're so- In your class, in not in the school, in your class. Well, actually, no, sorry, in the whole in the whole school. Because we're, so, okay. we're so spread out here, like we've talked about with the acreage and everything, we're not as densely populated. And we've started to bleed into other- cities like Falls Church and whatnot to put more into our school because there just aren't as many kids to fill in because right now we're a 6A level school, which is the largest. And there's been talk about Langley fluctuating on that because of our population not being as high as the other 6A schools around us. What about Maryland school-wise? That's from in my experience, um, you know, it's, it's similar to what Emily was just saying that the, the Montgomery County Public Schools are so highly rated, especially in um, Chevy Chase, Bethesda, and Potomac, super duper, like off the charts. The schools are so highly regarded. My experience is that once you get into the higher price points, none of those people are, are sending their kids to the public schools. Even it, it still drives the property value and it's still an absolute plus and it still attracts people. But my experience is that they still choose the private schools. Montgomery County and DC proper happen to have the vast majority of like those kind of, I mean, they're, they're a handful on the, on the Northern Virginia side, but I'd say the vast majority of like the elite private schools are really in DC and close in Maryland. And so my experience has been a lot of times when people are specifically already know their kids are going to Sidwell, Georgetown Day, um, Holton Arms, Bullis, Norwood, all, then they want to be in close in Maryland because the commute from Virginia, is it's really awful to do that, like for to be crossing the bridge and having that kind of commute for their kids. And I have a lot of friends who do now live on the Virginia side and they're doing the commute and they joke, they're like, we pass your house every day. <laughs> like five minutes before we hit our kids' school. Um, but I mean, great public schools and DC, even inside in DC proper, our elementary schools are really high, highly rated and have great communities and the neighborhoods really do feed the schools, um, in, especially in Upper Northwest and also on, on Capitol Hill and even downtown, quite a few of the elementary schools have um, are now uh, really like popular, like they're highly rated because the neighborhood people have started really sending their kids to school there and getting involved and supporting the PTA. Um, and people do send their kids to even middle and high school here in DC. Um, it, it, they do, you know. So it's, what I what I hear you saying in the parallel for a New Yorker uh, who, watching this show is that if you're moving to the New York area, there are pockets of New Jersey with great schools, Long Island, great schools, Westchester County, New York, Fairfield County, Connecticut. There's a, a handful in each, depending on what your tolerance is for the commute. Um, you know, do you want, are you one of those people who needs to be within 20 minutes of your office or can you um, move within an hour of your office and you get the green space? In both cases, you're saying that there's some great schools in Maryland. There's some great schools in DC proper and in Northern Virginia driving this decision. Yeah, we have great schools here. We have great public schools. I still find that, that once you get to a certain price point of a client, they are the vast majority of them are sending their kids to private school. And it's been my experience for now, this is my 20th year and I had plenty of 
friends, clients that I helped them buy and sell when they were younger before they had kids. And they chose to move out to the burbs because they thought they really wanted public schools. They didn't want to be in DC. And then they moved out to these neighborhoods and they never even sent their kids to public schools. They ended up going to private school anyway. So when we talk about the suburbs, we, oh, we're really talking, we're talking north of the city, west of the city, a little bit south, but we're not talking anything east, which I guess is all Maryland. Has that developed at all? Is it socioeconomically different? Like what's going, going east from the city? You get more for your money. Um, okay, you pulled up the map. You're, you're uh, a little too far over. But yeah, once you get Monk, once you get kind of east of Monk, east in Montgomery County and to the counties, the east, to the east of that, um, I think there are pockets with good schools, but the general perception is really still that like, and, and Montgomery County is just much more highly rated for the school system. So luxury market, I'm not going to find a, a luxury market east of Washington, D.C. I'm going to focus north and west. Yes? I well, don't. Yeah. Go ahead. You get a good luxury market when you go farther east and hit um, Annapolis. Yeah, by is, the water. Yeah. Yeah. Which is not a lot of second homes there. there. Correct. Got it. Most like the similar to Middleburg. You're going all the way. It's like the second homes or people who want to live on the water is Annapolis. Mm-hmm. Um, they're not really commuting into DC. It's there; mm -hmm. they have their own wonderful community, and it's second homes, and it's people who choose that lifestyle. I, I, it, I wouldn't call it a suburb of Washington DC. So, what's changed? We had COVID change disrupted the real estate market everywhere, and we've come out of COVID. And in our markets, we've a lot of the priorities have shifted for people: green space, uh, commute. So what's been ch what's changed in the last couple of years? What's become more desirable? What's become less desirable? Well, Where's during, the emphasis? During COVID, DC saw a mass exodus of people who were tired of being in their condo buildings. They wanted to get out. So Great Falls had been kind of a stagnant market for a while, and it just exploded. Awesome. Everything that came on the market multiple multiple offers gone in a day what's just, the sweet spot in great falls when that exodus came out the million dollar the two million the one acre well the half uh, you acre? know uh so there's the minimum of an acre usually and a house would go on for like 1.1 and it would sell at 1.6 it was just there was so much demand and people wanted their breathing room is that that's a big happening? bidding war right there. Wow. Is that still happening, million one? Or we don't see million one anymore. Now we're starting at a million six? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So everything's been repriced. Yeah. 30% higher. Likewise, in Mar on the Maryland side. I mean, Potomac, you know, with the joke was kind of like, well, but Potomac was like impossible to sell these giant houses forever and ever. And all of a sudden you can't, they were selling not only immediately, but in multiples of what, you know, just so much higher than they ever ever had. And those prices have all sustained with even with interest rates that have skyrocketed? Oh yes, because yeah. of our lack of inventory. Oh yes. Are most yeah. of those deals yeah. cash? Uh it depends what price point. Once you get over three in my market, it's you're usually seeing cash. Um not all, usually over three million, but still, you know, under that I'd say them still seeing a lot of loans. And $3 million is getting to the point where it may not go in the first weekend, or is that like, nope, that's still, we're still in the sweet spot where I got more buyers at the $3 million mark than I have inventory. If I have a good house, well-priced, bang, first weekend. True? And if it's priced well, it doesn't matter what the price point of it's unique in a, in a neighborhood where there's so little inventory, it's, it, it doesn't matter. I mean, I lost in multiple offers at on a $5 million house in Cle in DC, in Cleveland. And that's still going on. This isn't last year. This is going this on. This is recently, but it was super unique. Sure. And in a neighbor, like beautiful street, a lot of land. I mean, you still, that happens in DC. It was like back up to the park and it had hiking trails behind it. I mean, it was incredible. So this is your buyer who missed this? 
Yeah, I mean, we got so good... so 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 now what? Like what? What? Gary, you what's need to wake up them, like... in the morning. <laughs> so what, but what's me. next for them? Flowers. Uh, they're coming back in. They're out of towners. They're moving here. I have a lot of buyers moving from other places. So they're moving. From... Will you? Will you still have things? Will they? Will you find them something in the foreseeable future? Or is it going to be like, wow, it could be a long haul here? Yeah, things do generally in that price point. Once you get to be like, you know, four and five million, like you said, oftentimes they don't sell immediately. But if it's really unique and priced well compared to what else, and there's not much that is sold that's like it, but compared to what, if there's a value there, if the buyers see the value, if it looks unique and it has value, then it will still sell immediately regardless of the price point. So that property that was 17 million that I mentioned, which is right down the street from me near the near American University and near um, the Japan, right next to the Japanese embassy, it was six acres. They had multiple offers on that $17 million property because developers were bidding on a really unique parcel of land that, you know, it's, that you could walk to the metro, walk to restaurants. You so know, it's going to be subdivided, all that. Yes, I think so. Sounds so like you're that. in the high rent district, uh, <laughs> Sherry. I mean, yeah, no, I live, you know, I said I can walk to, and my kids go to public school in DC, by the way. So I'm not so fancy, but I, I can, I'm on a half an acre here in DC, but I can walk. I can walk to a restaurant. I can walk to Bethesda also. Um, we could walk to the Metro, although we don't use it. <laughs> you know, so I do, I like, I like the walkability piece. Is there right. walkability in Northern Virginia? It depends oh. which pocket. I mean, definitely over toward the East end um, and South of DC, like out Alexandria, Old Town, it has a, yeah strong Georgetown kind of characteristic to it. Um, definitely there, Del Rey. They're um, actually out in Fairfax. They're starting to make these planned communities with condos, um, the Mosaic District. It, you know, it has a Target. It has a theater. It has shopping, tons of restaurants. I mean, people just flock to it. So um, there is Are walkability. These who are these buyers? I'm I'm trying to understand uh, demographically what's driving all this demand. And when we look, when we've done a couple shows on demographics, and we've been watching the millennials now hit the center of the millennials is now a forty year old, and um, considering the suburbs buying a house uh, in order to uh, you know focus on a family, that's one of the drivers of the market. We've seen the baby boomers are trying to downsize into so what's driving these markets? Where what what where, what are the typical buyers and what are they and what's driving this huge demand? There's such a wide range. I mean we have CEOs with all the big companies coming in and Amazon's H2Q is now here. That caused a huge insurgence of everything from um, investors who wanted to scoop up rental properties, you know, everything down in Arlington that was going to be around that H2Q, uh, HQ2, just it, properties that had been sitting on the market for months were gone the next day, like over asking. You hear so, that, Roberto? Could have been yeah. Queens. Could have been New York. <laughs> I'm thinking the whole time. I'm like, what a disaster. <laughs> we we, we did a show. We did a show on that specifically around HQ2. So uh saying, well, what happened since Amazon decided not to come? And we had, we did a whole show on that. So um yeah. this is really interesting to us. What does happen? when uh, headquarters announces you're saying big driver for that market huge. I, yeah definitely tyson's corner specifically so it's a little bit more east of mclean it definitely is at least the when you're talking about millennials i have way too many people friends renting right now in tyson's arlington because there's so many companies headquartered there specifically like capital one we got big four we got fortune 500 companies that are all in that tyson's Arlington and a little bit of DC, but there's so many in Northern Virginia. So that's why you see a lot of people renting or living on maybe this side of the river and working and only having to commute into Virginia versus all the way into DC. But Tyson's is also another great walkability area. There's a huge mall, a lot of strip parts in between it. 
but in terms of just population everything for that young age it's definitely been tyson's and arlington for virginia i feel like and that yeah. rental, and those rentals are turning into the first time home buyers so just like what you were saying about the home buyers millennials topping it about 40 you're starting to see that 28 to 40 range really getting into the first time home buyer market are your buyers waiting for uh, affected by interest rates or are they more affected by a lack of inventory? It sounds to me like they're, it's the lack of inventory is the biggest challenge, not affordability. So I would say between June, July of last uh, summer until about November, there was a slowing of because of the interest rates going up, the buyers were slowing and pulling back a little bit. In November, December, we saw an increase. The talk about interest rates dropping, once we saw the inter interest rates dropping into the sixes, we had a huge resurgence of buyers back into the market. And we were advising our clients to really buy now because we felt that when it gets to be the spring market, and even though the interest rates will continue to at least report to continue to possibly drop again in March that you're then going to be competing with everyone else in the spring market and prices will increase your likelihood of, of obtaining your dream home. You might have to go multiple offers in order to get to that home. And so we definitely saw an increase with our first time home buyers, um, realizing that they don't want to be in the competition. They want to secure a home. So so you guys have a lot of international people come through there. Are they buyers or are they renters? It We're really can, buyers. Yeah. Yeah. We, it can vary. We we have actually uh embassy people that might be here for uh two, three, four, or five year periods. So it really depends on their position and whether their um, plan is to stay longer or is their term two years, they would be more likely a renter. But as you know, their affordability would also drive that as well. What price point do they wanna be in and what their lifestyle is uh, will also be a driving factor. And Roberto, you brought up an interesting fact about the um, foreign market. There's so many headquarters or, or foreign companies that have U.S. headquarters here, like Volkswagen, Rolls-Royce, um, uh, Nestle is actually, um, there's there's a lot of them and they're in the Northern Virginia, the headquarters are, are there. So they're coming here and they're coming here long-term. Wow. Yeah, a lot of foreign service officers, like over the years, I've had, they'd buy a property here and they weren't even planning to move in. It would be their home base. They would rent it. They'd rent it out for, you know, the next 15 years. They just have it. Um, and it was mentioned before, but we, I mean, last year we were, this area, our DC was, we were on the top 20 list for where ultra high net worth people own homes on the top 20 list of the entire world, mm -hmm. you know, there with Dubai. So there are a lot of people they're coming from abroad that they just, they want to have an extra, they have an extra place here. Sometimes these extra places are like in the form of an embassy, but we have a lot of uber wealthy people here that own property here. And my personal experience is really the job market is what drives why people move here. It's, it is fun. I've had a handful of downsizer clients the past year or two from clients of mine, their parents are moving to be near them, or they might finally they're young downsizers that don't have kids at home and like find this city to be fun and interesting and want to have even like close in Merrill. And they find these communities in Chevy Chase where you can walk, you can walk to things, but you have some space. It's just appealing to them. I had a call with new potential buyers. They've never been to Washington. They're moving from Ridgefield, Connecticut, which I've heard is just lovely, but they have friends in DC and they've heard it's amazing here. They want to retire or downsize here in this area. Ridgefield, Connecticut is beautiful. <laughs> and they've never been here. And they just said, we've decided, we've heard it's it's this and that. It has all the culture. It has the fun outdoor markets. It has the museums. And like, we're such a culture rich area. So we do have people that move here for that also. 
I still think the job, in my experience, it's, it's jobs. We have such a strong job market here. We're insulated by the government. We have so many companies. We have all these government contractors. Our job market is just amazing here. And that's what protected us after the crash of 2008. We didn't have the same crash that so many of the other markets did because of that. Historically, let's talk about the second home. Historically, the New Yorker, he drives out to the Hamptons. Maybe he goes to the vineyard. Uh, what we've now begun to see is uh, uh, splitting their time between New York and Florida, Connecticut and Florida. Are you seeing the same kind of uh, and California has experienced the same thing with Texas, right? So are you experiencing, because what I'm hearing is that historically they go east to Annapolis if they're interested in the water, they go west out to their horse farm to their second home. Are you starting to see a change in those patterns? Florida is a big second market for us. Absolutely. And hence yeah. that importance of being near Dulles and uh, being able to get in. Uh, National you know, airport. Close airport. Close to <laughs> National Airport is like really more the DC airport. Dallas is is 30 minutes outside of DC, 40 minutes. So National Airport is the one that's right uh right outside of DC. That's the closer. That's really the DC airport. But I can get a horse farm and still be what 15 minutes, 20 minutes from Dallas and head on down to Florida. Yeah. Are you seeing people starting to do that? Oh yeah. There's yeah. so many... the horse farm and the and the Florida and DC is like not what it was, unless I need to have a government job downtown or a unless contract they have their downtown. private jet that has a private and Leesburg has a private jet airport. So they could have that. But Dallas Airport being an international airport as well, and also has a hub for private planes. Um, a lot of CEOs, you know, keep their planes there. But yes, they they that secondary market is definitely what um Melody said, Florida. Yeah. And we have flights from National Airport that leave. It's just an easier airport to get in and out of. You can't use it for international travel, mm -hmm. but for getting in and out, it's just a much, it's a quicker airport. It's a smaller airport that they have flights like on the hour to mm -hmm. Naples, West Palm, Miami, Fort Lauderdale. Dallas does. No, I'm talking about National Airport. National, National, oh, so airport National is more convenient. Yeah. For, for people that really live close in and in the city and close in, and for these quick flights commuting, you know, it's a much quicker airport to get in and out of. Dallas is a huge international airport with multiple terminals and you're taking those uh, trams. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. yeah. What Drew. would be your elevator pitch to me if I was, I look, I'm so tired in New York. It's actually gotten too much and it's expensive. And you know what? I just, you know, I work remotely. I can work anywhere. You know, I was thinking about going to a smaller city, Boston, Chicago, maybe Charlotte, you know, Maybe DC. What's the elevator pitch for DC? For DC, DMV. Somebody else. DMV. For the DMV. We've got it all. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, you go a little farther east, you know, we have beaches. It's just, we've got the water. We've, we've got something for everyone. There's the hiking. There's the art. It's an art lover's dream. And unlike um, other cities like New York, Philadelphia, it doesn't, it's free. You know, we have oh, such a wealth of museums at our fingertips and it, you can see most of DC without spending a dime. Um, it's Melody, just- Melody, nothing's free. <laughs> it's free. It's, you pay your taxes and then it's free. <laughs> see? <laughs> That's well, and also- to add to Melody, I mean, the wineries, Tracy mentioned this earlier in the program, um, Virginia has close to 300 wineries. Um, believe it or not, it's the sixth largest winery area in the country. So Thomas Jefferson had it right when he thought and when he said, you know, Virginia has the topography for vineyards. So it's got amazing amount of vineyards, amazing amount of breweries. Like she said, we're three hours from beaches. We have mountains, trails, the museums. You've got green space, and it's a less expensive area. Than it's, a livable, it's a livable city here, is what I say to people when they're moving. You know, it's, it's really a livable city. You can, even in D.C. and very close in versus New York City, you can have a house with a yard and still live 
inside the city limits and be able to walk to things and have this lifestyle that's a little bit city and a little bit suburban with all these cult wonderful cultural things to do. Um, I think the other really, the plus that we haven't discussed here is really the people. This DC, the DMV, really, we have people from all over the world and also from all over the country. So it, and that's one of the first things people will ask you when you meet them, where are you from? The norm is that you're from somewhere else. So it has this welcoming vibe. Like my daughter's third grade class, a new kid just started two weeks ago from Italy. He speaks really no English, you know, and, and immediately like we're like, you know, making the month, you know, it's just a really, that's normal. It's not abnormal. You know, he'll, I'm sure he'll find other point. kids from Italy mm -hmm. in third grade, maybe not in the class. It's just people are from everywhere here. It's really, you might meet the most interesting, smartest people in this area. I, I agree with you. I think that the highest level of education that you're going to find that people who are in this area do have um, a very cultural diversity. They have um, high levels of education. They value education. And I think you're right, livability of the city. I would say what's a, what probably sets DC apart, maybe from New York, um, is that there's a height restriction on the buildings in, in DC. So you do have a, a certain feel for DC and its green spaces and its national parks and museums that is built into the terrain and, and of the city. So I think it, it does give that different vibe. City of Great trees. show guys, all clear. City of Trees. Thank you. Well, I wanna thank you. This has been uh, episode 122 on the DMV, I guess DC, Maryland, Virginia, also known or we covered Nova, Northern Virginia markets. Uh, I wanna thank Tracy Shively and the Shively team, Melody Hooker, Laura Bean, Emily Shively. And I wanna thank Shari Granval, who uh, from Compass, who pointed out, listen, I'm not a no Nova expert. I'm gonna be talking about <laughs> Maryland and the other side of the river. And you did not let us down. I will say when I got your promotional piece this morning, I looked for the, for the Maryland, for the Maryland promotions and I did not see them. So oh, I think you that's need- my luxury that. newsletter. That's our national, like, check out all the cool- I know, what, what's the guy got to do to get to, to get his, you know, a luxury- Getting it on, you're getting it on Feb Nova, 1. You're getting you know. it on Feb 1. Feb 1, you check your inbox, you'll have my DMV newsletter. Oh, and you'll definitely okay. have ours. Okay. <laughs> so- um, Thank you so much, guys. something really to amazing. sell me. Probably. And Thank I'm going to get, and I can subscribe to your newsletters and you're going to send me Nova DMV. Yep. All right. Excellent. Good everybody. Thank you for having Thank me. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. And remember to uh, tell all your friends and like, share, and uh, comment and uh, spread the word. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care, guys. See you, Johnny.